Hey Eugenia, what's up? It's Dustin again, and um, <laughs> I'm coming at you with another video today. And uh, this one's kind of exciting. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about this one for kind of quite a while, and uh, thinking the best way I wanted to do it, and I finally figured it out. And this video is actually a cool little video about Japan. So, <laughs> I know you love Japan so much, and I think Japan's really awesome too. Um, and yeah, I wanted to make you a um, things that you might not know about Japan video. So, um, I uh, read quite a bit about Japan, and boy, I learned some really interesting things. Stuff that I never knew before, you know? So uh, I thought it was really cool and fun to do, and I'm glad I could uh, learn a bunch of stuff along the way. So hopefully a lot of this stuff you don't know about Japan. So I tried to include the most interesting stuff possible. So, so you might go, oh wow, I didn't know that, you know, because I know I did. I was like, oh my god, really? <laughs> so yeah, okay. Let us get started about things you might not know about Japan. So Japan is an archipelago of islands and it's made up of about 6,852 islands. That's like a crazy amount. I had no idea there were so many islands, but yeah. And the islands of Japan are actually about 1,900 miles long, um, all the way from the Sea of ok Okhotsk, <laughs> which is far in the north, all the way down to the Philippine Sea in the south. So yeah, 1,900 miles along, and that Sea of Okhotsk, Okhotsk in the north, that's uh, actually right by Russia. So they are extremely close to far, far southeastern Russia. So yeah, and then all the way down to the Philippine Sea, and of course they're really close to mainland China as well. So Japan has five main islands, and starting in the north, the islands' names are Hokkaido, Honshu, Shikoku, Kyushu, and Okinawa. So those are the five biggest islands of Japan, and then there's thousands of other smaller islands all around Japan and further out to sea. So the Ryukyu Islands, um, they're the ones that extend far to the south um, below Kyushu Island, and that's kind of around Okinawa and everything else. So there's a lot of small archipelago islands that extend out there far to the south. And then the Nanpo Islands, is a group of islands that's in the uh, southeast of southeast from Japan's main island, um, all the way out in the Pacific Ocean. So they're pretty far out from the mainland. And I thought this was real interesting. Japan has the seventh biggest coastlines in the world. So if you take all the coastlines of all the oceans, it's around 18,400 miles of coastline. So that's like crazy. <laughs> like pretty much everyone could, I would think, be able to have a, uh, a nice ocean view property with that, min that much miles of coastline. So I thought that was kind of mind blowing when I heard that. And then the biggest island in Japan is almost in the direct center and that's Honshu Island. And of course that's where Tokyo is located, which is their biggest city. There's like around 38 million people metropolitan in the Tokyo metro area. That's like insanely big. It's like literally one of the, in one of the in the top top three biggest cities in the world. And there is a total of 104 million people in the whole country of Japan. So it is a really, really big country. It's way bigger than I thought. And Japan is actually mostly made up of mountains and there's about 111 active volcanoes in Japan right now. So I know Japan does get uh, earthquakes sometimes and that's usually because of the volcanic activity because it's extremely volcanically active there. So now the next thing that I know you love is anime. And of course, I'm sure you know anime started in Japan. 
but do you know how old anime is? And uh, I was pretty surprised when I saw the answer to this. And anime actually uh, started in 1907. So that was the first little short anime video. And it was about four seconds long. This is a screenshot of it right here. And it's about four seconds long and about 50 frames. And it was called Kat Katsudo Shashin. So, and it's a sailor guy in a, uh, he's in a sailor outfit and um, he's writing characters, Japanese characters on a board. So that was the first actual short animated film from Japan. So I thought that was pretty cool. And I thought it was interesting he's wearing a sailor outfit because you know in present day anime, it's mostly anime girls and they're in sailor outfits. So I thought it was interesting as it started out as male characters before it went to female characters as it is present day. So. So then the second oldest film was filmed in 1917, and I'll put a screenshot of that right here. Um, you can see the yellow and everything. They used a, it looks like a little bit different uh, kind of template that they drew these um, animations on. And um, this one, uh, it's about a four minute long video, and this is kind of a funny video, and it depicts this funny samurai character doing uh, goofy things. And um, yeah, he's like trying to figure out how to put the sword in his sheath and everything. And it's kind of like a slapstick, like Abbott and Costello from the old days. <laughs> so it's a slapstick kind of comedy kind of thing. So, um, and this one's called Namakura Gatana. So uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, in part of the video, he tries to sneak up on an enemy and he fails and the enemy finds him. He's like trying to be this great warrior, so it's kind of a comic approach to the samurai warrior in this uh, second anime video from Japan. So yeah, it was like 10 years later that this one was filmed. So, and you can watch these. Uh, if you just type in the name that I said, like Namakura Gatana um, anime short, you can watch them on YouTube if you want to see the first ever uh, anime shorts. And then manga, manga is even older than um, than anime. And manga, um, you know, it's like comic books. That's like, um, I think, Japan's comic books. Um, the cartooning of manga, um, one of the first published magazines was in 1874. Um, and this is Eshinban Nipponchi. So uh, yeah, that was the first one. Only three magazine issues were um, uh, published before the uh, the whole thing was canceled, unfortunately, because there was another one that that uh, kind of preceded it that um, it drew influences on, um, called the Dep Japan Punch. So the Japan Punch was kind of an unpublished magazine until Eschenbahn Nipponchi came out, but Eschenbahn took um, influences from the uh, uh, Japan Punch, and then Japan Punch became the 25 year long running magazine that was published um, for, yeah, 25 years, so that became the main one. And the Japan Punch was uh, started around 1862, so a man by the name of Charles Wordman I'm not sure if he was Japanese, but he, he immigrated to Japan. I don't know what he looks like, but um, he's the one that started Japan Punch, started cartooning, as you can still see here, that's uh, a copy of the one of the original pictures from the front of the magazine. So he's the one that started the uh, cartooning of that in 1862 and brought that to uh, Japan. So, and then Eschenbahn, that came after it that wasn't as popular, um, that was the first published, that was by Kanagaki uh, Rubin. So he sounds like he's a, a Japanese person there. And uh, yeah, so I thought that was real interesting about the uh, manga I did not know it was so old. Then the next one, Mount Fuji. And Mount Fuji is Japan's highest peak and it is one of the uh, holy mountains and many people, um, spiritualist, uh, tourists, uh, so many people use this as a pilgrimage site to go to um, and they've done it for hundreds and hundreds of years. 
So uh, yeah, lots of artists have used it for inspiration. I think it's just a beautiful mountain. It's so picturesque as you can see here. It's um, just the perfect cone shape, you know. And uh, it last erupted as a volcano back in 1708. So it's been over 300 years since that one's erupted, luckily. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's just one of the most beautiful mountains and has beautiful prominence. So there is so much mountain to see above ground level and sea level, um, just very picturesque. Um, but it is still an active volcano. Um, and it's actually uh, located about 62 miles southwest of the mega city of Tokyo on uh, Honshu Island, which is the biggest island. And on clear days, you can actually see Mount Fuji all the way from downtown Tokyo. So I thought that was uh, really, really cool. So 62 miles away with traffic, I don't know, might take about an hour and a half to get there or something. <laughs> I would think something like that. But, and every year around 400,000 people climb Mount Fuji. So I'm sure it's at least an intermediate to advanced mountain to climb, but I didn't know how many people actually climb that mountain. And it's actually 12,400 feet high. So sorry, I forgot to put that in there. So it's pretty high. It's like Mount Hood here in Oregon up by Portland. So it's a, it's a real high mountain, you know. And on, or, well, yeah, on at the top of and at the base, um, the base is the most important one. There is actually an ancient Shinto shrine. So, and I never, this is very interesting. Um, the This ancient Shinto shrine is called Fujisan Hongu Senken Taisha. And yeah, it's located in the town of Fuji Nomiya at the base of Mount Fuji. So it's uh, really close, really, really close. <laughs> and it is the number one leading Shinto shrine in um, all of Japan out of 1,300 different holy Shinto shrines. And um, a Shinto shrine, um, I found this so interesting. As put a picture there, it has the, the curved top with the two poles down. So that's, that's part of the symbol of the Shinto shrine. There's more to the shrine, but that's like kind of the symbol. And it's <laughs> what the Shinto shrine's purpose is to actually house and protect a kami or several kamis. And uh, a kami is a spirit or phenomena or holy powers that are venerated in the religion of Shinto. And I didn't know Shinto in Japan is their main religion. I had no idea about this. I thought this was so cool. And uh, they can be elements of nature. They can be landscapes, uh, forces of nature, like volcanic activity or weather or anything like that, um, as well as beings, um, people, like living beings and stuff, and uh, the uh, qualities that they express. So... And this uh, leading Shinto shrine at Mount Fuji was built around 71 BC to 130 AD. So kind of around the time of Jesus when he lived. Somewhere in there, there is the closest approximation of when it was built. Um, and it was during the reign of Emperor, Emperor Kiko, or Kaiko, K-E-I-K-O. And he built it to attend, to appease the kami of the mountain because at the time Mount Fuji was extremely volatile and active. So he built the Shinto shrine to help appease the god of the mountain, which was a kami. So that's why it was built. That was the first one built. So yeah, um, totally, totally didn't know any of that. But uh, it's cool to know that Shinto is their official religion in Japan. So thought that was amazing. Then another really awesome thing about Japan is the samurai. And I think I've mentioned this in stream before, Eugenie. I just love the samurai. I've seen samurai exhibit before up in Portland. Real samurai armor and everything and um, weaponry. It was just amazing. And uh, the samurai were the elite warriors of Japan that started around the 12th century. So in medieval times. 
and it continued all the way till around 1876 or so um, when the samurai were abolished, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, the uh, samurai, they were actually um, warrior nobles and they were of the highest ranking in the country in status in the Japanese society. Um, they were often called the uh, protectors of the, the estates. So basically, um, they were hired. Um, a lot of times they were hired by other nobility or even the emperor to complete tasks and uh, do some very difficult things. Yeah, initially the uh, non-warrior nobil nobility and even the emperor would employ these elite warriors for various tasks, like I was saying, and they were enlisted to help subdue many uprisings. So I guess they had a lot of rebellious uprisings by um, certain groups of people and they would use the samurai to come in and kind of calm the mob down and tame them out and say, you know, we're going to attack, you know, if uh, you guys don't uh, settle down with all this stuff. So they kind of showed their power in order to get things to uh, start to calm down to a more peaceful nature. So they were used for that. And uh, right here, uh, this is uh, one of the great samurai warriors, Kenshin Yusugi. And he wore this beautiful um, armor from the 15th century. Oh my God. So in the 1500s, he wore this amazing set of plate armor. I just think it's absolutely gorgeous. It's called a Hatamune Dao. So yeah, this is basically Japan's medieval armor, full plate. I mean, this stuff must have costed so much money, so expensive, but it is just exquisite craftsmanship. So, and I'm sure only the, the elitist of samurais could afford something like this, because this would be insanely priced like today, you know. <laughs> and then here, um, this is one of the weapons the samurais used. Um, it's like a large kind of polearm weapon, kind of like what Zongli uses in Genshin. Um, only this is called a uh, naganata. And uh, yeah, it's, it has a long wooden pole and uh, there is a uh, round hand guard between the blade and the shaft, um, you know, to guard your hands from getting injured. And it was used as, you know, a pole arm weapon with a wooden pole and then the uh, blade at the end. So they could use these to get horsemen off or to fight at a longer distance to help protect themselves. So there's a lot of people, samurais used them and, um, you know, uh, lower class warriors that didn't have, you know, as good a gear as maybe a samurai um, would uh, use these weapons too. So this is a very common uh, Japanese weapon in combat. I think it's real pretty. This is similar to one that I saw at the exhibit in the Portland Art Museum. So just exquisite craftsmanship. I can't even tell you when I saw it up close. Literally a machine looks like it would have done it. So these people did it by hand and it's amazing how, I mean, <laughs> a machine would be hard pressed today to get this perfection of, you know, grade with the blade and, and the um, design that's inlaid in the folding of the steel, just amazing. I found it, I find it really, really interesting. So, so then the other, really main weapons that samurai use, of course, were their swords. So, and that would be the katana, the tachi, and the wakazashi. Those are kind of the three um, main ones. And samurai usually carried two swords at a time. So, and the tachi and the katana, um, those blades uh, differ, you know, quite a bit in length and in curvature. So, um, and they they differ on how they were worn in the sheath when the samurai was just walking around um, in a normal day. So and the uh, the tachi swords those were the first of the swords that were made before the katana. So the tachi came first, and they preceded katanas. And uh, the katana was actually considered kind of an improvement over the tachi. Um, for pretty much everyone who would use a sword, but as soon as the katana became more of a mainstream sword with other people besides warriors using it, 
the samurai went back to the Tachi, I think they wanted to be using a sword that was different than what everyone else was using. So yeah, the Tachi, it was um, a bit longer in blade length than the katana at first. Um, and the katana at first had a shorter blade, but it had a, a bigger handle, so you can use it two hands on the katana. And the Tachi was more like one-handed. And then over time, the katana, they made a longer bladed katana, so it became an even bigger sword. But the Tachi kind of stayed the same in size. So your virtuous contract sword, Eugenia, from 2B, um, I'm pretty sure that's a katana, but it could be a Tachi. I'm not sure. Um, the handle is quite long on it, so it's either a katana or a tachi. I was trying to figure that out, but I love your uh, sword that you have from 2B. So it's either a katana or a tachi, I'm not sure. So yeah, the tachi did have more curvature in its blade, and the katana was not quite as curved. And then when a samurai wore a katana, it would be worn, worn pointing the blade up. So you would put it in your sheath with the sharp end of the blade pointing up. Um, whereas the tachi was worn the opposite way with the blade pointing down so you could distinguish which sword was which on the um, samurai warrior. And then the other one is the wakazashi. I'm putting all the pictures here because I found some really beautiful pictures to kind of show you um, what all these look like and maybe you can see some of the differences in the swords so but the wakazashi, wakazashi <laughs> was the shortest of the swords and um, it came in a lot later than the other two so it was kind of a newer one and yeah around the 15th or the 16th century and this was a lot shorter blade and handle this was kind of like a sidearm for soldiers today so this was a backup, so if you lost your main sword, if you were using a Tachi or a Katana, they would have this sword, a Wakazashi, short, way shorter blade, closer to like a Tanto blade. A Tanto is kind of like a real short Japanese blade. Um, they make them like Tanto knives and stuff, so they're really cool. They're, you know me, I love blades, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah. That was their backup sword, the Wakazashi. They'd pull that out as a last resort. Um, for So those are the main things I want to tell you about Eugenia. Um, hopefully you didn't know a lot of those things um, about Japan. I just had a few more random things that I found on the internet when I was reading all these interesting things. I could just keep reading it. it it's just so captivating, that country and their culture and everything. Um, so let me just tell you a few last... Uh, Interesting little facts about Japan. Japan actually has the oldest company in the world called Kongo Gumi. And this was founded around 578 AD and it's been in business ever since then. That's like crazy, you know? I mean, we're talking almost, what, 1,400 years or 1,500 years? And they uh, specialize in building temples and Shinto shrines. So, yeah, I guess that must have started when they got uh, really more into uh, Shinto shrine building in Japan. So, and it's still in business today. So I thought that was awesome. <laughs> in Japan, there is tons, millions of vending machines. Um, I think I read there's like five million or more vending machines in Japan. And it says there is one vending machine for every 24 people. So it has the highest density of um, vend vend vending machines in any country on earth. So, and you can buy anything in a vending machine in um, Japan. Batteries, sake, which is their, uh, their special alcohol drink they drink there. Um, um, umbrellas, electronics, food and even flowers so I mean you can buy like pretty much anything you want in a vending machine over there <laughs> and uh, entryways in Japanese homes are actually called uh, Genkin or Jenkin G-E-N-K-A-N Genkin I think so that is the entryway in a Japanese home and they are always raised and then the floor of the rest of the house is a, a little bit lower, like 
maybe five or six inches lower. So, and in this Gankin, the entryway, this is where you have to take off your shoes. So they are really big on taking their shoes off in Japan before you enter. So they must keep it very clean. Kind of sounds like my house because I always take off my shoes as soon as I get in and put them right by the door because I always want my carpet to be nice and clean and perfect. So I would totally uh, understand going in, into a house in Japan with their, uh, their uh, no shoes on the carpet or no shoes on the wood floor even. So, and this is another interesting thing. The first geishas in Japan were actually men and not women. So um, men would actually uh, dress up as jokesters or a jester and uh, yeah, they would dress up um, like in this female clothing, um, joking around and everything. And then 25 years later, women started to do it as a cultural thing and it started to be just take off as this, you know, female geisha dressing up thing that they would do. So, um, and a geisha means a person of the arts. So they're kind of dressing up in an artistic expression. So, which I always find interesting. Yeah. And just a couple more here. Um, I know I said Japan has like over a hundred million people in the country and um, they do have mac massive cities. So um, Kyoto, or I think the Kyoto um, Japanese Gardens is, that's one of the biggest Japanese cities as well. So with uh, so many uh, people in such massive, massive cities, it's kind of a crazy fact to know that the majority of Japan is not only covered by mountains, but also covered by forests. They have very thick forests. 69% of the country is actually all forest. So I thought that was pretty crazy. And I thought, I think that's awesome that there is so many massive forests and mountains to still go there to get out of the cities. So Japan does have some of the most densely populated cities in the world. So people are living so close to um, each other and on top of each other in so many high rise buildings. So, and I did read that um, nature is a huge part of Japanese culture because their Shinto religion is based on um, nature a lot. They believe that spirits reside in rocks, um, rivers, mountains, inanimate objects. They believe that that's what the Shinto religion is, um, which I thought was amazing, is uh, they believing in spirits are in everything and there's spirit energy everywhere. So I thought that was kind of totally cool and new and I had never heard that before. So they are very much about nature. So I'm sure that's why they keep so much natural areas and they really build up dense, you know, so that they can preserve what beautiful natural areas that they do have because, you know, they're islands. They don't have a lot of room like we do in the U.S. So, um, and one last interesting thing, Japan is the only country in the world that still has an emperor. Um, so, and then the current emperor is Emperor Naruhito, and uh, he actually took office as the newest emperor in May of 2019 and he seceded his father so and the emperor it still holds a lot of uh, uh, value and power in Japan not quite as much power as their current you know actual government but the emperor still does have a good amount of power and a lot of it is for the the culture and the status they just want to hold on to their emperor so, because it means a lot to their culture to have that emperor. Because it, uh, it's kind of like a symbol, I think, for their country and strength for all the people having the emperor. So, it's just in their traditions and values. And um, that's cool that they still uh, do that today. Kind of like England. It's one of the few monarchies left in the world with a king or a queen. So, uh, I think that's cool when countries hold on to that old lineage, you know. So, that is the video, Eugenia. That was hopefully several things you might not have known about Japan. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd love to go to Japan too, Eugenia. That'd be amazing. I'd love to take you to Japan. We can go together, <laughs> you know. So um, yeah, and see the Japanese gardens, of course. So, but 
uh, anyway, I love you, Eugenia. And ah, there's ah, some kisses for you. And I'm sending you hugs too. And I hope you're having a great day or a great night. So, yes. Um, yeah, I was really happy with all the things I found with this video. You know, I'd been thinking for a while, I'm like, I want to do a Japanese video. What could I, what could I do? You know, but then it just kind of popped in my head. It's like, well, how about just stuff that might be a little surprising that might not know about Japan? So I'm like, oh yeah, that would be perfect. You know, and I enjoyed it because I learned so much about Japan myself in the process of making it. So, but uh, anyway, okay. Love you, Eugenia, and I will see you in my next video. And yeah, hope you're having a good day. Okay, love you.